Books, books, I like books. I'm going to read them all. Hi readers, Chris here. I'm coming to you today with my final book review of 2022. Final book review of the year. I cannot believe it. And that is a, a very special book called Blue Revolution by S.E. Martins. This is an indie fantasy book that S.E. was kind enough to send to me. And actually, she found me, we found each other through Pax Panic. She knows Pax, Pax knows that I love fantasy. So when she heard about it, she sent her my way. So I do have to say thank you again, Pax, for sending this my way because this was the perfect book for me, the perfect book. Since this is a fantasy book, I'm gonna talk about the three normal things I do, world building characters and plot, but first, just a quick setup as to what this book is about. So our main character of the book is a young girl named Setsi. When the book opens up, Setsi is this young girl, she's a teenager, she's in high school, and she's very much like a stereotypical uh, shy girl. So she's very much like an outsider at school. She doesn't have any friends. She has this uh, wild purple hair that people think is a choice, but according to, accord, according to her, like her hair just grows that way. Uh, she also recently had a, a death in her family. Her father passed away, so now she lives with her stepmother and her stepmother's daughter. And of course, they're not exactly like the nicest to her because they don't understand her. So Setsi is in this place where she's really wanting a different life for herself. She is hoping that there's something better out there for her. So lo and behold, in classic fantasy tale style uh, story, Setsi gets pulled into this alternate world called Elysian. And when she gets to Elysian, everyone thinks that she is this princess. And not just any princess, that she is this princess, her name is Setsephony, Set Stephanie is not only a princess, but she is a rebel princess, and she is leading this rebellion against her father, who is the king of Elysian, but the king is not a, a great king, according to what these people tell her. So basically, Setsi now finds herself with this group of, you know, this ragtag group of rebels. She's trying to figure out, you know, is she really this princess that's been reincarnated? Does she belong there? Does she belong anywhere? And oh my god, her father is alive in this world? I mean, but he's supposedly the bad guy? What is going on? If that wasn't enough, there is a mysterious woman whose name I don't want to give away, but there is a mysterious woman who Setsi met in her own world, in our world, that seems to have followed her to Elysian. And she doesn't know who this woman is, what she wants, or why she is attacking her. And I'm not going to tell you either because that would be a spoiler. So world building. First of all, I love that in the world of Elysian, even though uh, Set Stephanie's father, the king, is currently in charge, this world has a long history of actually queens being in charge and actually the hierarchy of like a ruler of like the royal family, it's supposed to pass down from mother to daughter. So instead of a kingdom, they actually have a queendom. And I love that uh, S.E. took the time to put a map in her book because regular, some even regular fantasy books don't always have maps. So the fact that this indie one has one is super cool to me. I love a good book map. So I love that there is this long, rich history of uh, women being in charge. Um, I know that's something we're starting to see more and more often, but I just, I just really like the way that it's done here. It's really fun. And not only are women in charge, but like there's good female characters and there's also bad female characters. And I like that not all the women in charge are like these benevolent, you know, rulers, there's always, there's a light and a dark side to everything. And I think this book does a really good job at uh, exploring a lot of those uh, themes. Another thing is that this book really goes, you know, or 
goes in depth into why the king, the current king that's ruling Elysian, like what's really going on, like, you know, out in the world, out in the lands that is, you know, making people want to rebel against him. So even though we do have like our main cast of characters, our main cast of rebels, like they travel around a lot. So we really do get to see like a lot of different areas of this kingdom, both, you know, other noble houses and also like people that work in inns, people that are farmers. Like there's a very wide range of like, you know, royals, nobles, workers, and like everyone in between. And I think kind of seeing how all of those different pieces work together really help to make this feel like a like a real world, like a real place, even though it's full of magic and whimsy and wonder. So let's talk about the characters now, starting with our first character, uh, Setsi, aka Set Sephany. So like I mentioned, you know, in the beginning of the book, Setsi is very, um, She's almost kind of whiny a little bit. Like, yes, obviously her life is not great and she's struggling and she's having a hard time, but it also seems like she's not really doing anything about it either. Like, she's not taking any action to make her life better. She's just kind of waiting and wishing that something would happen for her, to her, instead of making it happen herself. So once she falls into this other world, though, um, I do kind of feel like the same things happen to her. Like it takes her a while to really, um, really adjust to this world, really adjust. And I think that's both like a good thing and a bad thing. Like on one hand, it is sometimes hard to see a character like struggle so much and just kind of be dragged along by everyone else and, you know, not really, you know, make their own decisions. But that is the journey that Setsi is on in this book. And it's really not until the end where like she finally does something that changes. I, I'm not going to say what it is, obviously, but Setsi has a very long journey in this book. And it was a bit frustrating at times because there are a lot of characters we don't always get to spend time with her. And I would say I would have liked to have spent a little bit more time with her and gotten a little bit more in her head. Maybe that maybe would have made her journey a little bit easier because like I said, she does come off as a bit whiny at times and doesn't really, you know, she's not that like spunky go-getter character. She's much more shy and quiet, doesn't know what's going on, etc, etc, etc. But again, I will say not every character has to be some spunky go-getter character and that's totally fine. But there is another character in here that is a more of a spunky go-getter type character, and that is Rhoda. So Rhoda is one of the members of this little rebellion or rebel group, and I think she might be my favorite. She's basically described as being like this kind of big, burly, like kick-ass warrior. Rhoda is the muscle of the group. She is the muscle. And first, yes, I love that a woman is the, the muscle of the team. She is the muscle. But underneath this like rough and gruff and hard exterior, she also has like a really good heart. She also has like a really deep soul where she cares about people, etc, etc, etc. As we learn about Rhoda throughout the book, this is one of the things I love about this book. I'm interrupting myself here. Every single character in this book has their own journey. So from Setsi to every member that's on this rebel team that I'm going to mention, like they all have their own unique journeys and their own unique arcs in this book, which I think is super fun. So Rhoda is the muscle of the team. Everyone on the team serves a purpose. I really liked her because she's big, she's burly, she's tough and rough, but she also has a really great sense of humor. She's a kick-ass warrior. She's also a really good friend, a really good person, and honestly, I think she was probably one of my favorites. Now, I can't talk about the rest of the Rebel crew without talking about kind of our other main character, and that's Kazuo. Kazuo. Kazuo is basically like the heartthrob of the team. <laughs> He's kind of the guy that brought everyone together. He's the heart of the team and everyone that's on the team is in love with him. He's kind of like, um, 
Yeah, he if if this group was a boy band, he would be the uh the Justin Timberlake or the Nick Carter. Like he's the one that brings everyone together. And of course, you know, as soon as Setsy lays eyes on him, she's like, Oh my god, like first of all, he's handsome, he's charming, and he's really just like the perfect guy, or at least seems like the perfect guy. But you know, as the story goes along, both me as a reader and then other people in the story really start to question what his motivations are. Because at first, it's like, where is he coming from? Like, why is he leading this rebellion? What does he want with, you know, what does the princess really mean to him? And, you know, Setsi is kind of feeling like, well, the way that Kazuo is acting towards me, does he really like me for me? Or does he think I'm this other person, this princess? And she doesn't really know. Kazuo was another very interesting character, and I think, you know, if there are future books, which I hope there will be at some time, I think there's a lot more to his story to dive into, a lot more. There's a ton of other characters, you know, they're a big group of rebels, and I kind of feel like their group and their team um, is kind of like a... um like a role-playing game. If you've ever played a role-playing game, like a video game, um, I feel like that is what this book reminds me of. It reminds me of a role-playing game. Uh, specifically, I would say Final Fantasy. If you've ever played any of the uh, Final Fantasy franchise, I feel like this book reminds me of Final Fantasy. It's like Final Fantasy mixed with Sailor Moon. Final Fantasy because you have like kind of a getting the team together, you have all these different characters, they go to all these different locations, they either have certain things they have to find at certain locations, there's like little magical creatures that they meet along the way that kind of pop in and out. I mean, it's really fun stuff. It's really fun stuff. And then the Sailor Moon aspect, I feel like, you know, if, you, if you're not familiar with Sailor Moon, it's basically a, a Japanese cartoon about young girls that are reincarnated from uh, princesses from different planets in the solar system, and they all have unique powers that they get from objects. And there's a couple objects that Setsi acquires during her journey, and it really just, it really reminded me of Sailor Moon. Like, I could just see her picking up one of these objects and, like, using its power and, like, transforming into a Sailor Scout. Like, that is, that's exactly the vibe that this book gave me. And if I'm being, those are, like, my two of my favorite things from my childhood. Final Fantasy and Sailor Moon were two of my absolutely favorite things in starting in middle school and then all through high school. So that is why I said like this book is perfect for me because it really like it really got all those nostalgia feels going. It really got all those nostalgia feels going. I always do this. I know I said I was going to talk about the plot. I kind of already did. I kind of did already. But I will just say that, you know, like I mentioned earlier, it's this group coming together they are being, you know, hunted by the king who's trying to stop them. They're trying to get to the king to defeat him. And Setsi is very torn because half of her is like starting to grow into this role as this princess. And she's starting to care about the people that she's with and believe in their mission. But then there's another side of her that's like, hey, I lost my father on earth. Like, this could be my chance to get back something that I lost. So she is very conflicted a lot of a, t a lot of the time through the book. And reading it, I even went back and forth. I was like, oh, I hope that maybe the king's not as bad as they say, and maybe she will be able to get her father back. And then the other half of me was like, oh, she's going to have to grow up and just kick his butt and, you know, get over it or something. So I kept going back and forth. I kept going back and forth. I will say that this book ends a little bit on a cliffhanger. It's not a complete cliffhanger. Like there is a clear beginning, middle and end to the book and there are a number of things that are wrapped up, but definitely not everything is wrapped up. Not everything is wrapped up. And I would say it's like 50-50, like 50% 50 of things are wrapped up and then the other 50% of things are clearly just setting up for a sequel, which I hope we get at one point at some point. Sometimes those type of things do annoy me. If you've been following me for a while, you know that. Um, but it didn't annoy me here. I didn't annoy me here because I think enough of the story was wrapped up. 
So to recap what I said about this book, I had an absolutely great time reading it. I loved it. The only thing I would have changed personally is maybe instead of uh, spending so much time with kind of the secondary characters, we could have got to spend a little bit more time with Setsi specifically like in her head. But other than that, um, I had a really great time reading it and I'm so glad I got the opportunity to. I will definitely be getting the sequel whenever it comes out and I hope that it gives me more uh, Final Fantasy and Sailor Moon vibes in the future. As always, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're not already, please subscribe to my channel for more bookish stuff coming your way soon. I guess uh, next year. How crazy is that? All right, everyone. Happy reading.